I greet, greet you all in Jesus' name. You got it right? Yeah. Good. I, I turned it the wrong way. <laughs> okay. Well, what a blessing. It's just uh, very good to be gathered with, with you all. And uh, it's been a blessing to be here and see the goodness of God being displayed to us. Um, I think I could remember of at least three or four uh, Sundays this summer that it rained. Um, seemingly, especially when I was speaking, I don't know, I don't know the link or anything, but uh, somehow I see the goodness of God in that, and just uh, thankful how He He lets the sun shine over the just and the unjust, or the right and the wrong, and lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust, and just He is not a respecter of persons in any way. So, uh, so thankful for that. I want to. I want to actually speak on that a little bit today. I uh, chose uh, James chapter two as the lesson and the reading, and uh, want to get started with that. And just want to try to tie tie it in with, or I think it is tied in with, with what Jesus spoke and taught and the way he lived and the example he left. I, I think, I believe, I see a, uh, a, a disciple or an apostle here that's going through, going through the, the ways of Jesus and here he is in his later life writing it down for us and it's a blessing. Let's pray before we start. <clears throat> God in heaven, we come before you with thankful hearts again for another day and another opportunity just how good you are to us and we uh, thank you so much for this place of, of fellowship and we trust that you're in the midst here and that the things we speak here would be according to your will and if it would not be God we pray that you would reveal it to us Thank you for these scriptures. Pray for your blessing on it. And just help us to uh, have a single eye on you and to, to uh, ever be faithful. Pray in Jesus' name. If there are some of you that are getting wet from over there there's room over here to sit if maybe it was just us over here where there's no trees but it was starting to rain on us a little bit all right <clears throat> i think i'll read the whole passage and then i'll go back through it and and uh, expound. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, or say to the poor, Sit thou there or sit here under my footstool? Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judge, judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit a sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a tr transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that show no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which they are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works as dead being alone, yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought his works? And by, by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the herlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. All right, so, so going back. <clears throat> um, going back through this, I... Uh, just had to think a lot about having faith with respect of persons um, and I tried to weigh these things out in my mind because because it was uh, also coming to my mind how how God has set out an order for mankind at first thought these things might want to conflict but I see no confliction um, I think what the apostle here is, is, is addressing is that in the, <clears throat> in the area of like rank or social status or in the area of whether a person is wealthy or poor, um, or whether well, the exact example here is given that whether someone's wearing the, the shiny clothes or not, that, that shouldn't be uh, our judgment on a man. Like, we shouldn't have that idea. Even though that doesn't mean that there isn't an order that God set out for, for a man, like, that the head of man is still Christ. The head of the woman is still a man. The head of Christ is still God, and so on. Um, I think we need to understand these deep things of faith. We need to at least, to some degree, admit that there's a mystery involved. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, it says that we are to hold um, the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. These, these are things that need to be worked out and worked on. It's not something that we can... At least for my, myself, I haven't just figured this out to where I 
I can say that there's no mystery for me. I have it all figured out. It is. Faith is, is a mystery in a, in a certain way. How do you uh, explain something that the evidence of it is its non-existence? Like how it says there in Hebrews 11, it says that faith Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So I believe that we have to come to a place to where we see things in the light of being born again. And what I mean by that is um, we need different eyes. We need eyes that see things through the light of, of uh, God and through the light of His kingdom. And this all has to happen through a conversion and a born again, um, you might call it an experience, but it doesn't, it doesn't, just an experience doesn't mean that you're in it. It, it we have to endure in these things. So, so God is not, God is not a respecter of persons in these things. Um, in Galatians 3, that's the first place I want to go to, if I can get there. Maybe I'll start reading in uh, Galatians 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus put on Christ therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female there is for all for you are all one in Christ Jesus and if ye be Christ Ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We become the children of Abraham through, through faith, not through lineage. We come through different places in the Bible. The, the people of God are described as children of Abraham. And that's something that we, uh, we receive through, through having the faith of Abraham. Uh, the lineage of Abraham was held to, to a high uh, regard in the Old Testament, but, but now it has, now we have, uh, that has been fulfilled. Now that it has been fulfilled, we receive uh, this inheritance through faith, the faith that Abraham had. Acts 10, Acts 10, verse 34, let's just read it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted unto him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel in preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee and after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazarene with the Holy Ghost and with power and who went about doing good and healing all that were op oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 
And ye, we were witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that he is that it is he which was ordained of God to be the church of the quick and the dead. Colossians 4. Just want to read some of these passages to remind us the heart of God and how he has a love for all people. It's not saying that all people love him. Colossians 3, verse 24 and 25. Know that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. I believe that this air of, res of respect of persons that is, uh, I don't know, was it prevalent there for, for the Apostle James? Was he addressing a problem? Um, I think this letter, this epistle was addressed as it, it is being uh, written to those that were scattered abroad, the Jews that were scattered abroad. And this was a problem in the Jewish culture, whether it was a problem here for sure or not? Probably it was. I see this thing very prevalent in mankind. Um, I see it when I when I go to uh, visit my family. Seems a lot of that seems to just kind of stick out where there's respect given, where it's not due, and where it's honor given, where it's not due. Even though we are called, according to Romans chapter 13, I think that's where it says that we are to, to give honor where honor is due, respect to where respect is due. Um, but these things, and tri tribute to where tribute is due, taxes, these things are important. But in the order of, like in the order of... Uh, If we're in subjection to someone, like we're in subjection to the authorities, then we need to give respect to them. We need to give tribute to them. But these, this all needs to be understood in the in the order of, of the God, of how God set things out. Um, I think earlier I mentioned how that the headship order is described in First Corinthians 11. But even further, in a in a sense, we are. Um, we are in subjection to the authorities because God is not a respect of persons just because we claim to you know this Christian life and the, and we should be trusted people doesn't mean that that now we the, the law of driving the speed limit doesn't apply to us you know these things apply to us and we should uh, respect that. But the respect in regard of, uh, which becomes, I think, a problem or an issue is, is when there's something that's degrading. I think there's two areas of respect of persons that, that are very bad, and that is possibly what's being addressed here. Um, 
two things. First, if there's a degrading, degrading to it, to where, oh, just sit, sit here under my footstool, or just, um, or or the other one would then be to lift someone up to a to a point of that it could be a stumbling block for them. And these these two things are. Uh, I think I've seen a lot of this happen. I, I think I've seen a lot of these things in the scriptures being prevalent. On down to verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? See that condition there? That there is a condition to to being heirs of his kingdom. The promise is to them that love him. Verse 6, But ye have oppressed the poor, but ye have oppressed the poor. Do not rich men op oppress you. Sorry, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. How is it that God has chosen the, the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Um, again, this, this is a man that, that had seen the works of God and had seen um, Jesus work miracles and to heal people. And so I had to just go and, and think of... Uh, of certain people in in the New Testament that that were like spiritually poor, and they came to Jesus, and He healed them, and and they were given uh, they were commended for their faith. One of them would be the the Canaanite woman. Um, it says that Jesus was going along the way, and um, this Canaanite woman came by and begged him to, to come heal heal his daughter. And he he uh, at first just neglected her and I think it was a a trying time for her just to just to keep persistent. And he said that it wouldn't wouldn't be uh, fitting to give the bread of the giving the bread to the dogs. But she said that that uh, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table and and then he he turned to her and and commended her for her faith according to your faith it shall be shall be done and that very moment her daughter was healed that was a per person that was a poor person of this world and became rich in faith and that's that's the way God has worked things out. Um, not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty are called. It's it's the wise of this world, the mighty of this world, the rich of this world that draw people draw people into uh, oppression. An example of that would be in in Acts. Um, might be Acts chapter Acts chapter 19 maybe I'll read that one Great is Diana of the Ephesians They saw that this preaching is uh, going to hinder their their prophet these rich rich men were greatly disturbed that Paul and his his helpers came by and preached the truth, and that this this would turn people away from their their prophet. And they they went and they uh, grabbed him and they oppressed him, just like James says. Um, this would be Acts nineteen verse twenty three. At the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines from Diana, 
brought no small gain unto the craftsmen whom he called together with with whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said sirs ye know that by this craft we have our wealth moreover ye see and hear that none alone that none alone at Ephesus but also throughout all Asia this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people saying that they they be no gods which are made with hands basically what Paul was saying that these crafted images are not they're not gods so that not only this craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great God as Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and they caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, false companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were with them, sent unto them, desiring them that he would not ad adventure himself into the theater. The part that I wanted to uh, point out was just how how that these these men were affected by Paul's preaching, and they they were rich, they were uh, they had their hearts stuck right on these uh, things that they could they could manufacture, and, and then they seen the, the de deterioration of their prophet when the apostles came around and preached the truth, and and they they oppressed the apostles, just like it says that it would happen. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called. <clears throat> Seems very much blasphemous the way they cried out, greatest the uh, Diana of the Ephesians. Verse 8 says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sins, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Um, here he used the term royal law. Two other places, James used the term uh, the perfect law of liberty, or at least the law of liberty. Um, I think he's speaking to us about just the law of God that's on our heart. Um, I had to think about this this law. Um, when when Paul stated the list of the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians, at the end, after he was saying all these things, love, joy, peace, um, gentleness, patience, goodness, faith, meekness, all these things, he said, and against these things there is no law. To me, that is saying, like, against these things there is no law. There is, there is no, no limits to how far you can go with these things. Um, these things in and of themselves are the law. There's no limits in them if that makes any sense. Uh, and here, when he's speaking about the royal law, I, I think that would be, could be implied as the same thing. It's such a big package or such a big, it involves so much that it's hard for me to describe what the law of God is. The old law had things like love your neighbor and hate your enemies. You know how Jesus said that that it has been said of them of old time, 
love your love your neighbor, love your fellow Jew, but hate your enemy. And the and the new, it is now uh, that we are to love our enemies. There's not this stipulation of take love just so far, just take it to to your surrounding Jews. No, now it goes to all the ends of the world. We are to love love uh, love our enemies. There is no more, like in today's world, we would say that there is no more, uh, there's no more borders of, uh, of countries in the kingdom of God. Now we love the Mexicans as much as we love um, the fellow U.S. citizens. But the world is just perverted. They have these things so messed up. They have their, now they want to big, build a big wall down there and make it so distinct that we're here and they're there and love the love your fellow u.s citizen and hate the mexicans basically it's just messed up um the law of god doesn't limit that we can we can go fool out and we can love love everyone even those that we're even called to do that love those that don't love us she has also said that what thank is there if you love those that love you and he said, do not the heathens do this? Like, this is a heathen practice to build these borders and to set up a kingdom for yourself on this earth. Now we can bring that even closer. We can see so many other heirs of these nations and how they built their walls and their, um, their own kingdoms. How is it with us in our... Our way of life, do we, do we, um, do we do that in any way as we go about life? Just have to get everyone to be thinking on our, on our level, have everyone uh, be convinced the way we're convinced. There is a truth that everyone has to be convinced of before they're a Christian. I understand that, but I'm speaking on, on, uh, more like personal convictions things. Are we building our own kingdom in this way? Do we love more than just our fellow fellow um, citizen of the church here? Like if we if we don't, it says here that that we commit a sin. Like if we have, I should say, it says if we have a respect of persons in that way, we commit a sin. And, and Jesus said, there is no thank for those that, that love just those that love them. No reward. No reward. At least no, earth, no heavenly reward. There might be an earthly reward. You pat the guy on the back that loves you, and he pats you back, and that's your reward. That's just... We're called, we're called into this royal law. We're called into this law of liberty, which doesn't... It doesn't put us, put any stipulation there. We can now love all out. I came across these accounts, or I come across these accounts in the Old Testament. People that in the New Testament are um, fathers of faith or or the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and then I go and read their accounts, and I just wonder what, what was it that that makes them this uh, this thing? And I'm I'm actually going to just leave that question there because I'm not I'm not sure if I'm if I'm equipped to answer it fully. Because I see Isaac doing things like he loved Rebecca more than Leah. Like he had this respect, you might say. I guess once you get into, I've heard brothers say that anywhere in the Bible where you see uh, people take multiple, multiple wives, it was just messed up. It was just no way that there was going to be harmony. And then you see how that Rebecca loved Jacob, Isaac loved Esau. But still he's lifted up as, as a father of faith. Um, so 
So at least what I'm, I was, I said I was going to leave that there as something to chew on. I do think, though, that, that the Old Testament has all these historical accounts and, and not the, the truth about the kingdom of God is in them only in a promise, not, not in the actual walking of these people. I think and I believe what, what made these people faithful was that they believed in the promise. They believed in the promise. That's what it says about Abraham might even say it in this very chapter I'm focusing on. I'm not sure. A scripture that kind of jumped out to me um, is 1 Corinthians 2, verse, verse 8, it says, um, whom, whom, whom none of the prince of this world knew, had they known that he was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. Another element of respect of persons that I um, came across, I think these people really were deceived. They, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And they did not know that he is the Lord of glory. It says here that had they known he was the Lord of glory, they would not have done this. And I just had to think how how blind that people can be in these areas. Um, if we don't fully comprehend how important it is, like the things that we do unto the least of these, my brethren, we have done it unto him. And that, that would have applied here had they put on this eye, these eyes that we need, the eyes of faith, they could have seen that this really is the Messiah. And in that scripture it says that, Paul says that had they known he, it was the Lord of glory that would not have crucified him. So I just made that connection, how that, if we don't, if we don't be careful how we act to people, first of all, it, it would be wrong just to, whoever it was, to, to condemn them to death like that and to take judgment into our hands. But just how blind they were. Had they known that, that it was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. And how that, you know, in their minds, this was just an evil, evil criminal, and they thought they had all the rights to do it. And even though they couldn't hardly find accusations against him, they did it. They still, they still crucified him. But just how bad it is that they would not have done it had they known it was the Lord of glory. All right, verse 11, I think I read 10. No, I didn't read verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. There's that phrase again, the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoices against, ju against judgment. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. I think I've seen these things maybe even in my own life, how it's so easy to, to really pounce on one truth and just really kind of pride yourself that you have this certain truth to the point that you, that you just hit it and you just have this truth, but, but then you, you miss it in another point. And this is pointing out how, how we're still guilty of all if we have not put in a desire or we have not um, put on these these new eyes that we need to look at things with. We're still guilty of guilty of, of it all. It says if we if we yet just carelessly offend in this other area. Just had a burden. I guess I'll speak about it a little bit. How, how I think I've seen people get tired of the Amish tradition and. 
um, in their eyes they get light. Maybe they got light, God knows. But they get, they get enough of this, um, the, the deadness of the Amish tradition, and they leave it saying that they now have light. They now have life. And, and a lot of them do. I, I'm not saying n no one does, but I just have a burden for a lot of these people, how, they, how I see their life unfolding and how they supposedly are in this light. But then what do you see in their fruits? It's like they, they uh, don't quite understand this, this law of liberty. Yeah, they, this law gives us liberty, but not liberty to the flesh. In Galatians 5, it says that, that um, um, if I can get it now, something about use, use not, that we are to walk in the, in the law of lip, in, in this law, but use not this liberty to the occasion of the flesh. And it seems like this gets abused. These people get um, light, they say, leave the Amish or Mennonites, or maybe even other cultures that, that have this stipulation on, on things and don't let people excel. So they come out of that, <clears throat> and the next thing you know, they're not excelling in the law of liberty, but in, but in, the, in the flesh, running after <clears throat> things of the flesh, just the, the showy lifestyle, the showy, uh, showy clothing and um, rather than being more concerned about having their head covered, their head, their head covering gets smaller. And these things are, they're very concerning to me when I see it happen. And it just makes me wonder whether, whether they, uh, they really have an understanding of the law of liberty, the royal law. This law, this law, um, has no stipulation to, to how far you can go with holiness and righteousness how far you can go with, with um, who all you can love. I mean, you can love, love everyone. <clears throat> Verse 14, I thought I had a few more thoughts about judgment and mercy. It's not really in my mind right now. If someone has, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> I just do know that though that Jesus spoke much about uh, with what measure we measure it'll be measured back to us and if we if we don't show mercy there's no mercy going to be shown to us and uh, here this is here that is being uh, spoken about again verse 14 what does it profit my brethren though a man say he has faith and have no works can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not these, those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being alone. Um, the the example that Jesus gave when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, at the very end he gave this example, and he said he likens um, the man that uh, heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, he likens unto the man that built his house upon the rock. I'm sure this story is very familiar with us. It should be a story that we teach to our children. And then the other side is... Um, the man that hears these sayings and does not do them, he will liken unto a man that built his house upon the sand. <clears throat> the winds come and the waves beat, and the house falls because it's built on the sand. The, the key there is, is the word not. Um, the first man uh, hurt, hurt these teachings, and he did do them. The second man hurt these teachings, and he did not do them. And I think that could very well have been the basis of the Apostle here writing these encouragements. A man may say he has faith and have not works. Can faith save him? Um, faith.
faith is just as all it involves so much. The next account I want to read is in Luke 17. It uh, be verse 5 through 10. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, Go sit down to meat. Go sit down to meat. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready, wherefore I may sup, and girt thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Dost thou thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded, commanded him? I throw not. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are un profitable servants and have done that which was our duty to do so here we see the um, the desire for faith linked with with serving um, serving one another and we also see it back here in in uh, what James is writing here faith without works cannot save us if we see a brother or a sister naked and destitute and daily food and we we just pass them by and depart in peace maybe something that's more likely to happen is something like well yeah you gotta you gotta neat there and you gotta I see you got a flat tire but I'll just commit you to God and then you just go on your busy busy day um, I think that's falsely committing someone to God like really committing someone to God would be, I mean, unless they have an emergency or something on the other end of your travels or whatever, it be, would be to really just take the time to, to uh, put some works to your faith that, that you claim to have and, and show forth your faith by your works, by helping the person. Um, the disciples here, had this desire to have their faith increased. Jesus gave this example of, well, serve, serve me, and um, and and in those in those ways, uh, you can become a you can become a faithful man. If if your faith is even small and as small as a mustard seed, it can grow from there. I think God's. Uh, gauge for whether someone has faith or not isn't so much in the size of it, but it's it's more in the like in the quality of it. Um, these things can be uh, hard to, de to discern sometimes. There's this false false faith that I'm afraid I I uh, I'm not aware of sometimes. I just don't know how to discern it sometimes. False false faith, people use that word so free and kind of just a toss around word. Um, when the Apostle Paul addressed, or when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he, he commended them for their, their uh, work of faith and their labor of love and their steadfastness of hope. And how encouraging that was when I read that they had they had a work of faith, and this is what this was pleasing to the apostle. Another thing I had to think of was uh, in Matthew twenty five. It speaks about the final judgment, how that it says in the judgment. Um, God is going to um, 
do like like a shepherd does to the sheep, and he's gonna he's gonna sort the sheep from the goats and put the put the sheep on the left and the goats on the on the right, and and he's gonna he's gonna say to the to the to the sheep that that uh, come to me, you bless it, you can inherit the kingdom of God, or or what? Maybe I should just read it so I don't don't mess it up. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right, the goats on the left, and then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them that are on the left hand, Depart from me, cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Seeking and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, and thirsty, or stranger, or naked, sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to the least of these, ye, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into ever into life eternal. The big difference here again is in the reading of it is the word not. How how earlier we had all also seen how um, the story of uh, building on the rock or building in the sand had to do with hearing his word and not doing it, or hearing his word and doing it. And here it was serving him or not serving him. And that makes a difference. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I just had some thoughts there, how that might apply to the present day, in a way that I might not have thought about it before. Um, there is this, it's called the ecumenical movement, where there, in these people's minds, there can be multiple churches, with each one having their special interests, doing their special thing, each one giving the other the credence of being the church, while they themselves, uh, like, yeah, this church has a strong point here, this church has a strong point here. If you don't like our weak point, just go to their strong point, and then at the end it'll all just pan out to the good. And I think that's what's maybe being addressed here. How that, how that uh, one person might try to say, well, I have faith, so I'll build my little kingdom over here. And the other person says, I have works. I'm going to build my little, little church over there. It'll all pan out to the good at the end anyhow. The, the, teaching, of, the teaching of the whole teaching of God 
has nothing to do with divisions like that. It has to do with unity. It has to do with, sure, there's going to be brothers with strong points and weak points, but these things need to need to harmonize. If we understand anything concerning um, the edification of the saints or the working of the of the body, then then these things should harmonize, where we can build each other up, and we we don't have to build these these borders and divisions. But so it goes, people people do these things. It's a misconception of faith. I don't think you can divide it up like that. Faith without works is dead. Do we want a dead faith, which really isn't a faith? No, I think we want a faith that that harmonizes with works and and this would work itself out that that if there's a strong brother then then we should be able to learn from that and if there's a weak brother we should be able to learn from that and this should harmonize to to the point that these things dissolve just like when we whip together a a recipe things things that are sweet and bitter are stirred together and they make a good taste and and we love to eat it And these are things that I'm learning and trying to figure out and walking in, in the truth of it. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. What's missing with the devils is that they don't have faith. They believe that there's a God because they, they know it. Um, unless they're to the point of deception, but, but I think that, that the, the devils and, and his servants know that there is a God. Like they believe that there is a God and that they believe in his existence. But they don't have, they don't have, they don't have the faith that this God is the only God, or that this God is the God of the universe that, that is going to bring on the final judgment, or whatever. They, they, they are lacking faith. And I think that's what makes them tremble. I think Galatians 3... Just read back in Galatians 3 again. I read that whole chapter and it really stuck out to me just in numerous ways. <clears throat> o foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit, question mark, receive ye the Spirit of the, by the works of the law or by the faith of, by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? There's, there's some of the things I was talking about earlier, how uh, people begin begin in the Spirit, and some of these people I'm talking about, I think, I think there is light given to them, but it's just very sobering to me how if we don't continue to walk in this light so easily, um, we'll just fall back into the flesh again. Verse 4, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers, ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even so Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Yeah, there, there is the point how uh, the children of Abraham are those that that are of faith, not of lineage. 
And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every man that hang, every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's real interesting how how the points are made here in uh, in Abraham being like the father of faith through the through the promise. He believed in the promise and that that made him faithful. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by, by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I don't have much more to share other than I, I just realized how... Um, misconceptions, misunder wrong understandings of scriptures can be so dangerous. And, and I just know if I have a wrong understanding of some of these things, and if, if my starting point of trying to reason these things out are already wrong, it can so easily take us down a very wrong track to where we have such a wrong conception of faith or how we, how we have an understanding of it or how we, how we see, see works there's there's so much that goes into it because there is a truth to the fact that um, the works of the flesh or the works that that man wants to wants to put into their own hands is uh, is distracting and it's it's not the work that we're called to do we're called to do the work of God so I have a thing of uh, Peter and John. When they were doing, they're in Acts 3, they were doing their their first miracles and stuff, and the people were really uh, fascinated by this to the point that they uh, they called together a, a band of people and they were, they were going to uh, really lift them up as something great. And Peter and John were like, no, no, look, don't, don't think that we have done this of our own works. This is the work of God that we did these things. So, so I had to think of that, how that they, they didn't take credit to themselves for having, um, being a part of this work of God. And in that way, when, when we do the work of God by obeying the Sermon on the Mount, we can't just go ahead and credit ourselves for it. We're only doing what we're told to do, like we read there in that passage about being the unprofitable servant. 
at the end of all things that we do through faith, it's not about us. It's about bringing glory to Him and being a light to the, to the world. After we have um, come back from plowing, which could be something like going out spreading the word like we do, or after we have fed all the fed all the poor, which could be like it was in that parable, fed, fed the king's animals. And after we have done all these things we're commanded to do, we should still just profess to be unprofitable servants. There's no no work that we do that we can uh, bring bring credit to ourselves for. It would seem as if that could ditch the whole thing of like we could go out and preach the gospel. Um, and I'm not I'm not wanting to be the judge of anyone in these things, but for myself, I think we could ditch all this if we had like the wrong motive of of doing these things. There is a danger in pointing fingers at each other and judging and condemning people's wrong motives. Like one one statement that's very dangerous to say would be as something like well, this person is truly doing the works of God. You know, and people around there would be would be saying the same. This person truly is doing the works of God, works of God, but then conclude, but it's with the wrong motive. Like I'm I'm not for that. If we see someone doing the right works, we should count that as righteousness. If we see someone sin, we should count that as sin. But but for myself, I know I, I have no credit to take to myself and and I have to be careful when I go out to do these things that I do them with with not stacking up points for myself and because at, at the end at the end it's going to be um, whether whether I have uh, tried to to please men or to please God and if I try to please men I'm trying to find glory for myself if I try to please God I'm trying to find glory for God and that's that's what we need to be doing. If there's any thoughts or comments to make, that'd be great. I uh, I would appreciate that. Some of these things I bring up are probably incomplete or need to be expounded upon. Or God bless you all. Brother Atley, you had so many points that uh, we, I need to work on, and I think it's very edifying that we all should, uh, I think we all should uh, consider seriously. The Lord knows those who are His, yet we're unprofitable servants, so work at a salvation with fear and trembling and rejoicing. Fear and trembling and rejoicing. Two comments I'll make would be... Uh, First one would be um, on a song that I listen to a lot. One now probably remembers it. Probably broke the tape listening to it so much, but uh, it's called "All Is Well." And, uh, in in, in the, the verses from this song, it says, "Oh, we're going to ring it with music and make heaven really uh, sound." And then it says, um, "Well." will make the chorus swell all as well when they get there by their singing. And, and I think that you could picture up in heaven, picture in your mind's eye up in heaven and the, the multitude and those who went before, the cloud of witnesses, and, and then Southwest Missouri gets up there and, and boy, we're going to make the chorus swell, you know, swell with our loud singing and, and everything. And they'd probably say, who are these rookies? You know, they're off key and shouting and just have to well, praise the Lord that they're here. But anyway, sometimes we can have a higher estimation of ourselves in that song. Oh, how we're going to make the chorus swell. Saints on earth, sing, join the saints above. And that's our goal, of course. But, uh, we should always have that humility and fear and trembling with, uh, with rejoicing. The second point would be uh, the ecumenical spirit. 
I agree with you 100 percent, Atlee. It's 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 the broad way. They have good intentions, but it is the broad way. It, it's today for that ecumenical spirit. The the principles in the Old Testament, or kind of principles, I guess. Well, you had uh, the man picking up sticks in the Sabbath. The Lord strictly wanted things this way. Nadab and Abihu, Uzzah. Uh, Achan, Achan taking a little goods from himself. And then in the New Testament, we have Ananias and Sapphira. We have the man living in uh, adultery or sin with his father's wife. God does want the church to be pure, unblemished, unspotless, or spotless rather. And uh, we have to work for that, not only in our own congregation, but to congregations that we fellowship with. And uh, God doesn't, how does Paul say it? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And the ecumenical spirit, I believe, is compromise after compromise. And it's not striving for the perfection. The Lord be magnified. I just wanted to comment on a, on one of <clears throat> one of the things Adley talked about is the walls that get built, uh, making reference to the the wall between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, what, one thing that I thought about is it just it just became obvious again why why the the kingdom that Christ built. Uh, cannot it is it is a different a unique and completely different kingdom than any kingdoms of this world and it it's why it it functions under a completely different set of laws and why you couldn't operate a, a physical kingdom or nation here in this world um, with with God's laws with the laws of of God's kingdom and, and maintain your piece of turf uh, or um, your boundaries or uh, because there are none, not, not in that sense. <clears throat> but I did think of, and I appreciated what Atlee shared about what about us? Uh, are we constructing walls? Um, and uh, and I just want us to all really like take that to heart. Are we doing that? If we are, we had better quit. But at the same time, I want us not to forget that we have a wall around us, and we don't want to want to be without that wall. Um, I once somewhere came across a list of churches, and the one church was called the No Walls Church, and I. Knew nothing of it, but I assumed that it it meant that they were wanting to put away with all man-made walls and man-made divisions. Along with that, I assumed that probably it's extremely ecumenical. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know anything to say about that church. But as I thought about it some more, I thought I don't want to be in a no walls church or in the no walls church because there's a wall. Uh, that we need and we want and I was thinking of maybe just giving everybody the assignment to figure out what it is but then it's it's so beautiful I just want to read it too so in Zechariah in the book in the prophet Zechariah in chapter 2 he says this and I looked up and behold a man in his and in his hand was a measuring line and I said to him where are you going and he, he said to me to measure Jerusalem to see its width, its length. And behold, the angel who was speaking to me stood up, and another angel went to meet him. And he spoke to him, saying, Run and speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be fruitfully inhabited by reason of the multitude of men and livestock in the midst of her, and I will be for her a wall of fire all around, says the Lord. And I will be in glory in the midst of her, says the Lord. 
that's the wall we want, we need around us, is that, is he himself being a wall of fire. Um, I just, and, and, and I, I don't know what else the prophet here, just offhand, I don't know what else the prophet here speaks about it, but thinking about that, to get within that wall, we, we must walk through it. Walk through the fire. Be willing to walk through it. Um, but it is only in that that we will be in that glory that's in the midst of it. So let's 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 be surrounded by that wall, but let's not build our own walls, and let's not try to build on top of that one, or make it any thicker or thinner. But just let it be what it is. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that about the wall, Dwayne. I uh, just like uh, but yeah, in the same sense, like I would say like we we do take the sword and we do have armor. It's just a different it's just a different kind. <clears throat> um, I th like thinking of this relationship between faith and works hearing and doing um, Paul said he had he had zeal but not according to knowledge so um, I think uh, a lot of times or most of the time probably maybe even except except for this place right here where, where, where James is making the uh, addressing that there's a distinction being made between these two elements of faith, one having the proper understanding and, and, and then the other being like a faithful working out of that understanding. But most of the time, or maybe all the time, that that's just, it's just, both of those elements are implied. And, and then where, where we get into trouble is when we, we just try to, when we try to isolate, when we try to isolate one of those, like John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him, like, oh, see, there, just believe, just, that's all it is, is believe, but it's, it's obviously implied that that proper understanding would be accompanied by a zeal or a, a faithful um, working out many, um, I, I think that's, you know, part part of the Great Commission is um, is helping people with their understanding of what, what it is to put what it is to put their faith in because maybe there's we know of many that have a zeal for God but it, it's it's misdirected and uh, I, it doesn't seem like you, you, doesn't seem like you misdirect you get points for misdirected zeal if it's not in the, the the proper people aren't putting their faith in the, in the proper things um, for like for example trying to prevent bad things from happening by by doing violence and somebody like in their mind you know they have this zeal they're trying to protect people they're trying to help people they're they're trying to do good but it's mis it's misdirected um, and we uh, it's like we would acknowledge yeah to to restrain ourselves from uh, from committing violence in order to prevent a bad thing from happening seems foolish. I mean, there's even, I think, a psalm that says, I think it's a psalm anyway, that how bad it is to see something bad happening and not, not put forth effort to try to prevent it. And I mean, the truth is, I think it would be wrong to not put forth effort. It, it's just like we put forth effort in a different, we have faith that um, God has shown us like to put forth effort in different ways, like not in that way, not with a physical sword, not with the arm of, of strength. Um, and uh, like it says, if well, it says, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we are of all we are of all men most most miserable. If if that man really didn't come from God and and tell us that we're supposed to uh, be like sheep and be like doves and be harmless and and not do violence and to love our enemies then 
then we're totally blowing it. If, if we're not supposed to, if this man didn't have the authority, if we're put, we'd be putting our faith in, in all the wrong things. If we're, if we're not supposed to be putting faith in, in mammon or in, in, in the riches of this world, we're totally blowing it. We're just passing up all these opportunities. Um, we're just letting, letting people get hurt or letting our things get, get taken. Um, so there, anyway, there's this element of putting your faith in the, in the proper thing. But, and then there's this distinction between, there, there's, but then there's no cons, <laughs> but then there's no consolation in that alone. Like, though we've come to the proper understanding, like that, it's of, it's of, uh, it's of zero value. It's dead. Um, it, it, like, um, it'd be hearing and not, and not doing. Um, there's great value. Obviously, there's great value in, in the hearing of the, of the right thing. But then, um, but then none if, if we don't do, um, 